Uh, first and foremost, uh, it will keep us on our toes and make sure that we added up all the points correctly. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but on occasion, if you're you know, adding up 200 different papers, uh, a mistake is made here or there. Uh, and if such a mistake was made uh, in uh, not in your favor, uh, it would be in your best interest to bring it to our attention. Um, if it was made in your favor, it's up to you to decide whether it's in your best interest to bring it to our attention. Uh, I'd encourage you to do so out of honesty's sake, but uh, I understand that uh, it's not really quite that honest. Um, the other component of that is uh, that uh, I have instructed the TAs uh, that did the grading for your papers. Uh, you will put as much comment uh, on the papers as are necessary uh, in order to explain why you got the grade that you got. And uh, the upshot of that is that if you got an A on your paper, chances are you won't get much in the way of, uh, of, of uh, comments. If you've got a C minus, uh, you should have a fair number of comments. And those comments should make it clear what was missing and why you got the grade that you got. Uh, if after looking through those comments, you're not sure why you got the grade that you got, uh, it is uh, certainly a good idea uh, for you under those circumstances to approach your PA uh, and simply say, look, I looked over your comments uh, and uh, it doesn't make sense to me why I ended up with the grade that I got. Can you give me a more detailed explanation? And I'm sure they'll be happy uh, to go over the comments with you uh, and to clarify what was missing. Uh, if after having spoken to your TA, if you're still not certain why you got the grade that you got, uh, ultimately the buck in this course stops with me. Uh, so if you've uh, already spoken to your TA, uh, you can uh, then uh, take the next step and bring it, uh, and bring it to my attention. Uh, and I will uh, take a more careful look at it and re-grade it uh, and uh, provide you with the grade uh, that I think is appropriate and with an explanation for why that grade is appropriate. Uh, it doesn't rarely happen. The TAs are very much, uh, or it doesn't very often happen. Uh, the TAs are very conscientious uh, in grading the papers, uh, and uh, I've worked with most of them uh, on a number of uh, in a number of years previously. Uh, they are uh, very knowledgeable, and very conscientious in the grading. Uh, but of course, uh, in a large class like this, uh, it is often possible that uh, some something got missed, uh, and uh, it would be a good idea for you to bring it to my attention. For those of you that have approached me uh, about uh, questions with regard to your paper at this point. Um, and uh, have been sent away. Uh, I uh, sent you away not because of, uh, I'm uh, mean and cruel, uh, that's part of it, uh, <laughs> but the main reason is that I was not the person that graded it, and uh, consequently uh, it's uh, much easier uh, for the TAs uh, to provide you comments, uh, and uh, that's therefore the best starting point. Okay, uh, before I begin today's lecture, let me see if there's any quick questions or comments about anything else related to the class. If not, uh, then let me try to pick up where we left off last class. Uh, last class, we began to look at uh, the actions of non-state actors uh, in the international realm, and began that discussion by looking at the uh, form of violence that is far more widespread uh, in the international system today than uh, interstate wars, uh, which are civil wars. Uh, what I want to do today is uh, to pick up on that and look at a closely related uh, topic, which is that of international terrorism, uh, before uh, moving on uh, to the main topic of uh, discussion for today and for the next few weeks, uh, which is international political economy. Uh, terrorism is fairly closely related uh, to uh, civil war uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, among them uh, is that almost all civil wars uh, begin uh, with a phase uh, of what might be called terrorism. Uh, this indeed is the conclusion that uh, Richard Polk came to uh, in his uh, analysis uh, of insurgencies throughout history. In the book called Violent Politics, uh, which I uh, strongly recommend for those of you that are interested in that kind of thing. Uh, but that close relationship uh, between terrorism uh, and civil war, which doesn't always exist, uh, but frequently does, uh, demonstrates why uh, there is considerable controversy about the issue of terrorism, and why that adage, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, uh, still to a considerable extent holds water. So for example, uh, when we look at the current crisis in Syria and the various groups involved in battling against the Syrian, Syrian government, uh, well, the Syrian government calls all of them terrorists. Uh, the West calls at least some of them terrorists, uh, meaning in particular those that they don't like. 
uh, Saudi Arabia uh, calls all of them freedom fighters. Uh, in other words, uh, they consider the Assad government to be entirely illegitimate. And the illegitimacy and the brutality of the Assad government, in their eyes, at least justifies uh, whatever uh, the opponents of that regime are doing in trying to bring it down. And that makes talking, to, talking about terrorism uh, a little bit complicated. Uh, there's little bit of agreement about who precisely are terrorists, what precisely terrorism is, and it is a label that is generally thrown at whoever we want to discredit, for whatever reason we may want to discredit them. Uh, but as political scientists, uh, we can move beyond that uh, and create at least some clarity uh, in terms of what precisely we mean by terrorism and some clarity about how important of a phenomenon it is, uh, whether it is a growing phenomenon, uh, whether it is one that is in decline, whether it is a phenomenon that poses a threat to the international order, or one that is merely an inconvenience, uh, and uh, a nasty inconvenience, uh, but nonetheless not one that threatens the global order. Uh, your textbook provides a fairly straightforward uh, definition uh, of terrorism, which I think is slightly altered here. It defines it as premeditate a, the premeditated threat or use of violence against civilian targets by individuals or subnational groups to achieve political or social objectives through the creation of an atmosphere of fear and intimidation. Uh, now, I've altered that definition only slightly uh, by putting part of it uh, into parentheses. And that part is by individuals and subnational groups. Uh, the reason that I do so is to highlight uh, one aspect of terrorism, uh, which uh, many, especially those that uh, work for states, uh, would rather ignore. Uh, and that is that uh, terrorism is not exclusively carried on by individuals or subnational groups. Uh, to define it that way uh, limits our analysis of what terrorism is rather significantly. There is, of course, group terrorism and indeed individual terrorism. Uh, but historically, at least, the far larger categories are those of state-sponsored state terrorism uh, and indeed state terrorism itself. Now, uh, I can't give you a full history of uh, terrorism, uh, but uh, I'll just point out a few instances of things that have been termed terrorism uh, over uh, the centuries. Uh, and it illustrates uh, that uh, terrorism and actions like terrorism have a rather long history. Uh, the first uh, to have uh, that label applied to them uh, were the group known as the Zealots, uh, who tried to drive the uh, Romans, uh, who were militarily far superior to uh, the Zealots themselves, uh, out of Palestine uh, back in the 6th century BC. And did so in large part not by confronting the Roman military directly, uh, but rather uh, by engaging in a campaign of assassinations uh, to make their ability to control uh, the territory of Palestine more difficult, and eventually to sap their will to continue uh, their ongoing presence there. Since then, uh, a whole slew of other uh, examples. Uh, one well-known one is uh, Guy Fawkes' attempt uh, in the gunpowder plot uh, to blow up the Houses of Parliament in an attempt to overthrow uh, James I. Um, most of us uh, if, that are not from the British Isles, where Guy Fawkes Day is still celebrated with, uh, with um, uh, fireworks, uh, only became aware of the uh, Guy Fawkes plot as a result of a rather interesting um, movie uh, on the subject of terrorism, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, V for Vendetta. Uh, which I don't uh, want to recommend as, a, as a, 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 a something to watch to get an education on terrorism, uh, but it's <laughs> provocative uh, and uh, certainly worth, uh, worth seeing. It's uh, good entertainment if nothing else. Um, the assassination of President McKinley uh, by an anarchist in uh, 1898 has often also been described uh, as terrorism. Uh, although the question uh, arises in this particular instance, uh, can President McKinley uh, be considered a civilian target, uh, given uh, that he is the President of the United States, and as the President of the United States, uh, he is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States. 
uh, and uh, some at least would argue that that would make him a legitimate target in a war. Uh, but that's another topic that we'll get to uh, in a little bit, in a, a bit more. Uh, certainly, uh, the individual that, that assassinated him was not acting on behalf of the state, and as such, was not legitimately uh, entitled uh, to, to a wage war uh, against the United States or anyone else. Uh, and thus, we could throw that into the same category uh, as the other examples. Uh, the group Irgun uh, Tsubai Luyumi uh, what, uh, was responsible for a bombing of the uh, King David Hotel in 1946 uh, in uh, Tel Aviv, I believe it was, uh, which is uh, often seen as a very blatant act of terrorism, uh, and one that preceded the establishment uh, of, uh, of the State of Israel, and was part of the process of creating the circumstances uh, within which uh, the State of Israel uh, could establish itself. Uh, the Black September group uh, attacked uh, the Munich Olympics in 1972. And indeed, the Olympics have been a favorite target uh, of terrorist groups ever since, uh, and something that is certainly uh, Mr. Putin is well aware of uh, in the lead up to the Sochi Olympics, uh, where uh, several groups, uh, especially those associated with uh, Chechen nationalism, uh, have uh, indicated their intention uh, to, if at all possible, disrupt uh, the Sochi Olympics uh, as a means of drawing attention, international attention, to the plight that they suffer uh, in uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, in the Black September incident uh, in 1972, uh, Palestinian quote-unquote terrorists uh, infiltrated uh, the housing unit of the Israeli team uh, took a large portion of that uh, team hostage, uh, most of whom were eventually uh, killed either by the uh, Black uh, September group itself uh, or in the rather mishandled police response uh, that uh, ended the uh, incident uh, back in 1972. In the same year, uh, the Irish Republican Army uh, launched a series of bombings uh, in Belfast. Uh, in essence, uh, to drive the British uh, out of Northern uh, Ireland and to undermine uh, the dominance of, of Protestant groups associated with the British uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, classic terrorism in that the 22 bombs were all relatively indiscriminate in terms of the targets that were selected. Uh, indiscriminate at least uh, in, from the point of view of distinguishing between civilian and military targets. Uh, not so much between uh, uh, of distinguishing between Catholic and Protestant targets, uh, since they were clearly geared uh, toward uh, damaging Protestant targets uh, more than uh, Catholic ones. A slightly different act of terrorism, uh, but an act of terrorism that fits that description above uh, nonetheless, uh, was the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero in El Salvador in 1980. El Salvador at the time was in the midst of a bloody civil war, uh, that pitted uh, the government, uh, dominated by the interests of uh, the 14 dominant families that own virtually uh, the entire uh, country of El Salvador, against the vast majority of uh, the impoverished uh, citizens of El Salvador, uh, that were trying to institute uh, some kind of land reform, uh, create a more egalitarian social order, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, the battle against them uh, very much involved uh, on the part of uh, the El Salvador state acts of terror. And while the assassination was carried out uh, by a group that was not directly under the command uh, of uh, the El Salvador state, uh, it consisted mostly of either former members of the military or members of the military out of uniform at the time uh, that they participated in it and uh, was led by one of the most powerful uh, individuals within El Salvador uh, at the time, uh, Roberto de Albizon. Again, you don't need to remember all those names. Why was it terrorism if it took place within a civil war? It was terrorism insofar as it was very blatantly an attack on a civilian target, the Archbishop uh, of San Salvador, who was shot in the church while giving mass. And why was he, was he shot? Uh, was, he, was it because he was an important official uh, in, the, uh, in the Civil War? Not at all. Uh, did he wield any force uh, in that Civil War? Not at all. 
However, he had spoken out against what he considered the extremely unjust status quo in El Salvador, and by doing so gave at least uh, vocal support uh, to the cause uh, of the guerrillas, of the insurgency. Uh, and uh, the intention of the assassination was quite clearly to intimidate anyone uh, willing to raise their voice uh, in opposition to that status quo. Uh, the uh, first and probably most, well not the first, uh, but certainly the most uh, important experience that Canada has had with terrorism, uh, the first was probably the FLQ crisis uh, in the 1970s, uh, was the attack on the Air India flight uh, 182 uh, in 1985. Uh, a plane that was brought down uh, over the Pacific uh, by uh, Sikh extremists uh, trying to undermine uh, Indian control uh, over the Sikh uh, region uh, of India. Uh, in 1993, uh, the World Trade Center uh, was attacked uh, by terrorists. Uh, the precursor to the September 11th attacks uh, and prior to the uh, existence of, uh, or at least the term Al-Qaeda, uh, to describe the group that uh, originated that attack. Uh, it did not cause as, nearly as much damage, obviously, as the subsequent attack. Uh, it, uh, I do believe there were two people that were killed and a few people that were hurt. Uh, it was, uh, the bomb was located in a, in a van uh, that was parked in the basement garage at the World Trade Center. Uh, it did not bring the building down. Uh, in 1995, a obscure group in Japan uh, released poison gas, uh, sarin gas, and gas into the Tokyo subways uh, in a bizarre plot to undermine uh, the control of the, J the Japanese government. Uh, a very different form of terrorism uh, was that carried out by Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma City in 1995, uh, in which uh, he again used a van uh, loaded with explosives uh, in the form of uh, agricultural chemicals uh, mixed with oil and so on. Uh, parked in front of the federal building in the in Oklahoma City uh, and ignited the uh, bomb uh, and in the process uh, killed uh, close to 100 people, uh, including uh, the majority of kids in a, uh, in a uh, daycare that was uh, located on the first floor of that building. Uh, he did so as an individual. Uh, he had one other partner and perhaps a few others that may have been associated, but he was the dominant figure. Uh, he was not part of a larger group uh, or organization. Uh, and did so uh, according to his own testimony uh, in response to the brutality on the, on the part of the American government uh, that he uh, observed uh, in the attack uh, by uh, federal authorities on a compound in Waco, Texas, uh, two years earlier, uh, in which um, a religious cult uh, was uh, being accused of uh, stockpiling weapons in that compound. Uh, and the uh, uh, federal government uh, sent in uh, uh, forces uh, that uh, used incendiary devices tanks basically to blow the, the globe place up uh, and in the process killed uh, 30 uh, children um, uh, that were located in that compound as well as most of the adults uh, that were there as well. And then of course uh, there's September 11, uh, 2001, uh, which I won't have to talk too much about. Most of us remember uh, very well uh, where we were at the moment uh, that those attacks took place. Uh, many of you were still pretty young at the time so you may not remember that uh, all that well. Uh, but it certainly was uh, an uh, event uh, that will live in infamy, to use the uh, terminology that was uh, uh, used by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in describing the attacks of Pearl Harbor. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the attacks of September 11th uh, in a few minutes. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit more about, um, well, uh, there's that book uh, that I talked about by William Cole, um, Final Politics, in which he came to the conclusion uh, that all uh, anti-colonial struggles and indeed all revolutionary struggles uh, have begun throughout the history that he examined, which we began, began, which began with the American Revolution uh, and looked at a number of, of insurgencies and anti-colonial struggles uh, since then, uh, with a period uh, of terrorism. In other words, he argued that terrorism is an important component of any asymmetrical warfare. Asymmetrical warfare meaning war between a highly developed and organized uh, military force uh, and groups that oppose that military force but don't have anywhere near uh, the capacities and resources in order to do so. Thus, in the American Revolution, uh, in the Spanish resistance to Napoleon's occupation of Spain, uh, in the uh, resistance to French colonialism in, uh, in Algeria, 
uh, and hundreds of other examples. And he argues invariably the pattern that was followed by those that opposed uh, these colonial uh, regimes uh, was uh, to at first make those regimes on the one hand appear weak uh, by attacking targets uh, that are poorly protected or not protected. Uh, and by doing so, uh, at the same time, create this atmosphere of fear uh, and uh, a perception uh, that the existing authorities can't uh, protect uh, all uh, of those that are under their control. And secondly, uh, to provoke a uh, response uh, from those authorities, a, a disproportionate response, uh, that may further serve to undermine their authority or their legitimacy and at the same time, uh, increase the support uh, of opposition groups uh, to uh, that authority. Uh, as the opposition builds, uh, as a result of this uh, first uh, stage of that asymmetrical warfare, uh, eventually, uh, the Pope argues, uh, the power of those opposing colonial regimes begins to increase. Uh, through greater resources, through greater numbers, through better organization, uh, leading eventually to a point at which uh, they can openly challenge uh, the military forces uh, of the colonial uh, government uh, and thus produce a revolution. So George Washington and uh, people like him uh, were also at one point or another uh, active uh, in what might today be described as terrorism. But of course, uh, the term terrorism didn't exist at the time. Uh, the term terrorism, insofar as it has an origin, uh, had its origin in the French Revolution. Uh, and in the period immediately after the overthrow of uh, the monarchy uh, in France, uh, generally described as the reign of terror, the reign of terror, in which the new French government the revolutionary government sought to eliminate its, its opponents, in particular uh, those associated with the Ancien regime, uh, the previous uh, regime, through the extensive use of uh, the guillotine. Uh, and uh, the guillotine was used uh, not just in a discreet manner, uh, hidden away from uh, public eyes, but very deliberately uh, in town squares. Uh, in the center of towns uh, with large audiences, um, in part uh, because um, well, uh, humans uh, have a tendency to for uh, bloodthirstiness, uh, and there are lots of folks that uh, enjoy that kind of thing. Uh, but <laughs> those that don't enjoy those kind of things uh, would nonetheless uh, get the general picture. Uh, if you oppose this government, uh, these are the consequences. Um, the extent to which uh, there are humans that uh, enjoy that kind of thing uh, is uh, uh, is um, always a bit of a puzzle to me, uh, but uh, it's fairly evident. Uh, the, a couple of years back, uh, there was a, a fellow in uh, Texas, which you uh, were probably aware is one of these states that, uh, at a faster rate than any other state in the United States, executes its prisoners. Uh, prisoners, uh, and uh, uh, one and apparently prisoners were given a, a choice uh, as to the means of execution. Uh, and for some odd reason, I forget the guy, the fellow's name, uh, but uh, he shows uh, that he wanted to be uh, executed by firing squad, uh, which had been done in decades uh, in Texas. Texas, uh, And um, uh, they were somewhat miffed by this, but uh, they decided to agree on it, and therefore asked for volunteers to be members of the firing squad. And what they didn't expect is that there were hundreds of thousands uh, of, uh, of uh, volunteers that called out instantly, waiting to be on that uh, firing squad. Um, <laughs> That's human nature. Um, or maybe not, hopefully not. Uh, suffice it to say uh, that uh, the first instances of terrorism uh, that justified the term uh, terrorism uh, were acts of states. Uh, and again, I don't want to go through a whole catalog of acts of states uh, that fit that overall description. Uh, suffice it to uh, mention just a few uh, prominent examples thereof. Uh, the French Revolution was certainly one of them. Uh, Joseph Stalin's uh, campaigns uh, of terror uh, were certainly another good example uh, thereof. Uh, Joseph Stalin uh, engaged in numerous purges in which he tried to eliminate his opponents or anyone that threatened his government 
uh, and sometimes, sometimes he's focused, focused not on uh, explicit opponents, but actually on members of his own, uh, his own uh, 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 government, uh, which for whatever reason were seen as disloyal. Uh, and also did so uh, in uh, what became known as the fourth forced collectiv collectivization of agriculture, uh, in which uh, peasants that occupied independent plots of land uh, were forced off of those uh, lands uh, into large state-owned farms uh, that were supposed to be more efficient uh, at producing agricultural outputs. Uh, most historians that have looked at uh, the collectivization of agriculture argue that it had little to do uh, with the concerns over the productivity of agriculture and had a great deal to do uh, with the fact that peasants that controlled independent plots of land uh, were thus independent from the government and not as effectively controlled by the government as uh, they would be once they were all boarded into uh, large uh, state farms. Suffice it to say, say that Stalin uh, made extensive use uh, of violence against civilian targets in order to create an atmosphere of intimidation uh, for political purposes. And the political purpose in that case was first and foremost uh, to perpetuate his own uh, rule. Uh, Stalin was certainly not the only one uh, guilty of these kinds of atrocities. Uh, a similar method of dealing uh, with opposition uh, has been noted by historians uh, throughout the ages including in looking at uh, the Roman Empire, among other places. Uh, but uh, the regime of Assad uh, Sr. Uh, and his uh, current son uh, have also made use of state terrorism in order to perpetuate themselves uh, in government, as, of course, uh, did uh, Nazi Germany uh, during the Second World War, in particular in occupied territory. Uh, what that boiled down to? is in the case of the Assad regime in Syria, uh, when uh, a act of rebellion took place in a particular town, uh, such as an assassination of a, uh, of a state leader or a demonstration against this rule or something along those lines, um, he took care of it pretty, pretty quickly uh, by making an example of that location. Uh, in other words, by engaging in what might be called collective punishment. Uh, raising that town to the ground uh, and uh, killing whoever was in it. Uh, essentially, that generally drove the point home. Uh, a, don't rebel against my rule, and B, don't allow anyone in your village to rebel against my, uh, my rule, uh, or else you will all be collectively held responsible. And this, to a large extent, uh, was also uh, the case uh, with regard to the Nazi occupation forces, uh, in particular in Eastern Europe, uh, where they were successful, uh, with the exception of the Balkans, in ever allowing a serious uh, challenge to their rule in the form of insurgencies or resistance fighters. Uh, and one reason for that is A, because they had a lot of uh, willing collaborators uh, in uh, parts of Poland, Ukraine, and so on. Uh, but the other side of it is that insofar as uh, there was an 